to our last and final unit. So the finish line is in view. You're almost there. You're almost there. But before we begin, when do astronauts eat lunch? When do astronauts eat lunch? At launch time. Okay. What do you call a cow with a twitch? What do you call a cow with a twitch? Beef jerky. Okay. Sorry if you're vegetarian. I apologize. How do you have a successful solar system party? A successful solar system party. How do you have one of those? You plan it. Okay. All right. Course reviews are out. <laughs> There's always feedback about the jokes. Some love it, some don't. So, so you're welcome to provide your input. If Keller needs to change his material, I get it. All right. It entertains me every year, but, you know, simple minds, right? So what we're diving into is special senses. We're going to be here for the rest of the semester. Uh, as I mentioned, Friday, you've got your final quiz due. Thursday's our withdrawal deadline. We'll be here for four lectures. We're just going to go methodically through all the special senses. And hopefully at this point, when we make a lot of these comparisons back to prior topics and material, there'll be some connections that you'll make. You'll start to see some familiar systems, some familiar architecture, and even some fam familiar terminology. Uh, you know, the special senses have been, you know, fascinating us for since the beginning of humanity. And they're kind of interesting because sensory input is critical to our intellectual function, right? It actually interfaces personality and intellectual function. So we have a not-so-new puppy now. I mean, she's, she's about a year and a half old now. But when she was in, in uh, training, like dog training, whatever, the, the trainer really actually emphasized this. Um, how many of you have pets? How many of you have a dog? Not that I'm going to hate on the cat owners, but dogs, it's a dog example. So when you walk your dog, your dog interfaces with its environment by how? By smelling, right? And it's, it's, so it, in my house, we kind of refer to it as, I'm going to take Nori for a smell. Because there's like a very little amount of walking and a lot of smelling. And it's less about the exercise. It's more about this integration of intellectual function with the, the outside environment. And so think about um, friends or family members, or I mean, if you can remember when you were an infant. But what do we do with infants? If you're gonna be a pediatrician, what's the early phases of development? What do we try to encourage for our young Padawans? Padawan's not a medical term, by the way, just in case you're curious. You're like, how do you spell that? Is that Greek or? Uh... I think it's Tatooine in case you're curious, but just kidding. Some of you like that joke. What do we try to encourage with our young Children. It's not a trick question. I mean, I'm just trying to get you to engage with the material. Sensory input, right? We play music. We sing. You put colorful toys in front of them. Right? You don't blindfold them, stick them in a closet, and tie their hands behind their back. Right? I mean, what do, what do little infants do with everything that they see? Put it in their mouth. They're trying to, they're curious, like, what's happening? That's the same as my dog out on a walk, or a smell, as we call it. 
just smelling the environment. And now those neuronal connections are starting to be made. So we build toys with colors, and it makes noise, and um, it, it interfaces with all these uh, sensory inputs, different types of uh, fabric or different architecture, right? In, in, the, in the crib, you, put a, you hang a mobile over the, over the infant while they're falling asleep, right? You have fancy displays on the ceiling, you know, from some projector toy on the ground. So this is how we interact with our environment. And it's absolutely critical to the development of our intellect and our personality. It actually defines us. This information is communicated by these organs we call sensory organs. And sometimes it's not even a conscious type of perception. And, and you understand that. You can appreciate the subconscious versus, you know, visceral versus somatic, right? We've got things like uh, blood pressure, body temperature, muscle tension, right? Our Golgi tendon, our muscle spindle. All of these things are giving us information about our surrounding environment. These sensory organs initiate uh, somatic and visceral reflexes, and they're critical to our life, our homeostasis, and even our survival. So what are sensory receptors? So we're talking broadly now about sensory input. We're not focused yet. We're not diving into the, the, the special senses, although I was talking about childhood development and talking about sounds and you know, colors and vision and all that. So back up a second, just think about sensation. Well, these are receptors that have a structure that detect some type of stimulus. So they're nerve endings. If you have a nerve ending, a nerve, the end of a nerve embedded in tissue, and something happens to the tissue, the nerve's going to sense it, the nerve ending, what's it going to transmit? What? What's it going to transmit? What's the signal it's going to send? An action potential. Right? So we're just incorporating what we already know. These are sensory receptors. They have nerve endings that actually are embedded in them. And they give information about the environment. So if I back way up to unit one, back way up to the beginning with the integument, we back up to lab when you were looking at the structures in the skin. We didn't focus as much on the Meisner's corpuscle but I'm going to highlight the Meisner's corpuscle. You've seen it a few times now. This is a sensory organ. It's not a special sensory organ. It's just found throughout all of your skin. It's located right at this interface between the epidermis and the dermis. Uh, you can see the dermal papillae, which is the DP, coming up, and the red pegs coming down, kind of form like this dovetail interaction. Gives integrity to the skin. And right at that interface, is where you have a Meisner's corpuscle that is a nerve ending that's surrounded by tissue. That Meisner's corpuscle is a mechanoreceptor. It detects light touch, light pressure. It's encapsulated with tissue, and it has unmyelinated nerve endings that, that innervate it. It's surrounded by connective tissue. And its function is to give you information about something light. Like, I, 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 know where the, I know where the railing is. I can feel the railing even though my eyes are closed. I, I, I can actually sense this is the end of the lecture. And I know the stage is somewhere over here. And I know that's the stage because I can feel the fabric on the skirt, which is like a velvety. That's all Meisner's corpuscle giving you information about your surrounding environment. Okay, But there's a lot of stuff there that we just talked about. If you're following that, you're remembering all this cumulative information that you've learned between lab and lecture throughout the semester, which is kind of cool. So the sensory receptor, specialized structure to detect a stimulus. That's its purpose. Detect a stimulus. Some receptors are just bare nerve endings. 
Uh, there's our true organized, what we call organs. Like the Meisner's corpuscle. You can see a schematic, a cartoon drawing of the Meisner's corpuscle right here. Simple, but kind of cool in a way. Now, some of the surrounding accessory tissues could be things like muscle or connective tissue or an added epithelium. But this is really, when you break it down, what sensation is all about. So now if we break down the general properties of a receptor, we've got three things. Transduction, that's sending the signal. We have receptor potential. That's actually, what, what word does this remind you of, potential? What unit does the word potential remind you of? What's that? The nervous unit, right? Bless you. So a potential could be either a local or a graded potential, or an action potential, right? Then the third one's on this slide, and I'll, I'll come back, is sensation. That's the third characteristic. So transduction, receptor potential, and on the next slide is sensation. So let's just walk through them. Transduction, this is converting one form of energy to another. That's what sensors do. You know, for example, the Meisner's corpuscle about the lectern, or maybe it's the stage and the velvet skirt at the bottom, or maybe it's the carpet, the indoor-outdoor carpet, right, that's on the top, I'm getting mechanical touch, mechanical pressure, and I'm sending an action potential to the somatosensory cortex in the brain. So I'm, I've converted the energy from pressure to electricity. Okay? This is the purpose of a receptor. Now, there's some other examples. You could, you could actually say, I'm going to convert light or heat or sound into an action potential, otherwise known as a nerve signal. I gave you the, uh, the example of touch, but that's how sound, heat, light, all of them are being perceived by your brain as action potentials, electrical signals. In the last 10 years, there's been tremendous medical device development in the space of hearing or non-hearing, right? And you've probably seen patients now. It's pretty commonplace. My dad has one, and that's a cochlear implant. And it's a device that usually sits on the outside of the cranium, and there's wiring that goes into the vestibular cochlear nerve. And that receptor outside is receiving sound waves and sending electricity from those sound waves to stimulate your cochlear nerve so that you can hear sounds. That's what your ear does. We're going to get to that later in this unit. But cochlear implants are now more commonplace. When I was sitting where you are, that was futuristic, we kn but we knew that was a possibility because really all you're doing, all you're doing, right, all your ears do, is take sound waves and convert it to electricity. Well, can't, can't we figure out a way to engineer that? Well, we have. Now, my dad says that, and he has an early uh, version of it, but <clears throat> like there's a lot of training, and because he's older, the brain's not as plastic, so it's harder to train, so he said, a lot of the sounds sound, in the beginning, it sounds more like static. In the old days, you, you, don't, how, how, you probably don't even know how a radio works anymore, but um, we used to have these devices called radios, and you, you could actually uh, tune it where it wasn't on a station, and you would get static. If you watch like old movies, you'll, you'll, you'll catch this, okay? And it's that static, like that, and you can hear, and then you get it a little closer, to the right station and you can every now and then you catch a word it's like you know hello right he said that's kind of how it sounds in the beginning then he trains his his brain was learning relearning how to hear he says it's better now but you know he's 77 so i mean um, for him you know learning something that we all take for granted at the age of 77 is is more difficult 
Okay, <clears throat> this sensory organ, um, and like a gasoline engine and light bulbs are all examples of transducers. They all convert energy from one form to another. Receptor potential, just like the word would suggest in this class, small local electrical change on a receptor brought about by a stimulus. Now you get a neurotransmitter or you get a series or a volley, that's what that word means, like a series of action potentials that generate a nerve signal that goes to the central nervous system. And that's how we perceive that information. And then last but not least, sensation. So three properties of a receptor. This is the awareness of the stimulation. So these are delivered to the central nervous system. They typically cause no conscious sensation. Um, they're usually filtered out in the brain stem. Um, and like, what I mean by that is you don't, you don't get a signal that's, that, that tells you consciously, oh, felt. That's definitely felt, right? There's not a conscious awareness of stage. Does that make sense? There's no, there's no auditory response. It, it, that's, that's what that's saying. Uh, a lot of that's filtered out in the brainstem, more autonomic. But even further is some of it doesn't even co uh, require conscious awareness. For me to like feel my way around and find this opening between the lectern and the stage, I consciously have to be aware of it. But I'm monitoring the pH and the oxygen saturation in my blood the whole time I'm trying to find my way through the stage in the lecture. Right? So conscious decisions about receptor information versus unconscious, like pH, body temperature, oxygen sat. So this is a nice little homework assignment. I would like you to be able to fill out this table. I'd like you to be able to compare and contrast general senses that we've been really highlighting with, with special senses. Talk about characteristics for each in the first row, and then talk about locations for each in the second row. We'll pick up Wednesday's lecture here, okay? We'll, we'll come back to this, and I'll, I'll talk about, I'll ask you for some feedback. The other thing that I'm going to ask you to do for Wednesday is to give an example of a transducer that's a real life example, other than one that I've already talked about. I already talked about light bulb, talked about a gas engine. So you can, you can work independently. You can text your friends. You can go to SI session. This would be a great way to try to make these connections. There's a little bit of a hint on this upper right picture as well. Transferring one form of energy to another. So list, give me an example of a transducer on Wednesday. Okay, and I want a couple of people to participate on Wednesday. So for the rest of today, we're going to kind of finish out the general properties of receptors, and then we're going to start moving into a little bit of um, what we know about these special senses. But if we think about um, these receptive fields that you can see on this slide, we've got four characteristics here. So we had three general characteristics of sensory receptors. Now we have four general properties of receptors, right? Two different topics. Here we're listing modality, location, intensity, and duration. So the modality is the type of stimulus that the sensation produces. So for example, uh, is it something that you see? Is it something that you hear? Is it something that you touch? Something that you taste? The location. This is determined by how it's encoded with the nerve fibers that go to the brain. So where it ends up. If it goes to the occipital lobe, it's vision. If it goes to the somatosensory cortex, Right? It's going to be sensory information about the periphery somewhere. Now, the intensity. 
the brain can distinguish the intensity in a number of different ways, like how many fibers are firing, how, many, uh, how fast are they firing, and which ones are sending the signals. Right? So which nerve fibers are sending the signals, how many fibers are being recruited, and how fast are they firing? So think about pain as an example. Like all pain is not the same, right? You've got dull pain. You've got sharp stabbing pain, right? So how many of you have had an injury and you went to an orthopedist? Come on, raise your hand, okay? How many of you had a stomach bug and you went in to see the doctor because it's bad, and it's like day five, and something needs to happen to change your course. <clears throat> so you broke an arm, right? Other than the obvious of, you know, there's a bone sticking out of your left arm, it's a pretty sharp pain, and you know exactly where the break is. You with me? If you sprain your ankle, you twist your ankle, right? You pull a muscle, you know, like, oh, it's right here. You go into the doctor for belly pain. They say, where does it hurt? And this is the best example is with little ones, like pediatric medicine. Where does it hurt? All over here, right? We'll talk about that, too. But when your belly is upset, it's like the whole region. It's not like, I'm pretty sure it's two centimeters into the duodenum right there, right? It's just more of the whole gut Right? That's dull pain. So there's different types of pain. We'll get into that at the end of the lecture. So that gets into intensity. And then, of course, duration, how long the stimulus lasts. So I hope on the characteristic slide and the properties slide, you can anticipate some potential test questions about defining receptors. You with me? Like This is like a field day of where to pull a test question from, a multiple to choice test question. I think a lot of you are figuring this stuff out after, you know, exam four and seeing how you did. It's, it's becoming a little bit more comfortable with respect to what I'm asking of you and how I'm asking. Okay, let's talk about receptive field uh, as an example. So <clears throat> on the left, you can see what we refer to as a large receptive field. So you have one neuron that feeds a broad area of the skin. And... This is not how this device is indicated to be used, right? This is from a geometry class. But instead of using the protractor, you're just you know, making a point. Um, you've got two different points on the back. The one neuron has a more difficult time discriminating between these two points because it's a large receptive field. The field is broadly receiving information. So if you have two points of contact over a large receptive field, it, it's hard to tell if it's one or two or three. Compare that to small receptive field, like on the fingertips, on the fingertips, or on the palm of your hand. Small receptive field, where you have more neurons coming in to receive input to discriminate the point of contact. So I want you to partner up. This one we're going to do in class. And <clears throat> I actually want you guys to see if you can do this. You can do this on, on the shoulder blade. You, know, you can just do this like over your clothing, right? You, you can put two points of contact with your finger or three points of contact. Have your, have your buddy close their eyes and then do it on the palm of their hand and see if you can tell the difference. Okay? So partner up. Just do a large receptive field over the scapula and then do a small receptive field on the palm of the hand. Try that real quick.
You guys can partner up. There we go. You got to close your eyes. You got to close your eyes. You can't be staring at it. Now that's cheating. Come on. You got to close your eyes. Okay, who got that to work? Who got that to work? Some of you got uh, very uh, intuitive. You're, you're pulling out pencils and things. That's a great idea. Anybody get that to work? Anybody try it? You understand the concept? Large versus small receptive field. So what's the, what's the point? Like, what's the value? Why would the body be organized this way? Any ideas? No ideas? Yeah, biological energy to build three neurons onto the entire area of your back like cover that whole real estate of your back when really all you're going to be doing is putting on and off your shirt right i mean you're not trying to you're not trying to discriminate okay that's the that's the uh, the pointer that's my phone that's my water bottle right you're not doing that with your back so why would you build all those neurons i know it's a silly example but does that make sense i mean that's how you can remember this and I'd, I'd like you to believe that it makes a lot of sense the way it's designed. Okay, classification. As we classify these receptors, and we're going to be getting into these classifications here today, and then we'll kind of carry them forward throughout the next three lectures. We can classify them by mode, by origin of stimulation, or by where they're located. And the distribution where they're located is kind of the hint to one of the take-home assignments. So we'll get there in a second. Modality, thermoreceptors, detect what? What do you think? Temperature. Photoreceptors, detect what? Light. Nociceptors, that one might be tougher. Pain, good job. Chemoreceptors. What do they detect? It's not a trick word. Chemicals. Chemicals, nicely done. And last but not least, mechanoreceptors. Pressure. Pressure. Origin. They could be detecting external stimuli, like exterior receptors, or interior receptors for internal stimuli. So in the case of light, Right? That's an external receptor or exterior receptor. In the case of pH, temperature, oxygen saturation, that's an interior receptor. Proprioceptors detect body position and movement. And we'll get into some proprioception when we talk about the inner ear at the very end. And then distribution. So I hinted at one of the take-home assignments or homeworks for Wednesday that we'll go over that table. It's kind of comparing and contrasting general versus special. So general are widespread. They're widely distributed. They're found all throughout the body. The special senses, like, for example, Meisner corpuscles are everywhere the skin's located. Pacinian corpuscles, everywhere the skin's located. Special senses are limited to the head. You've got five. Vision, hearing, equilibrium, taste, and smell. All found in the head. So that's the big difference if we're talking about classifying receptors based on distribution. So let's look at um, some of the ones that make up these receptors, like unencapsulated, and then we'll look at encapsulated. So unencapsulated nerve endings, the dendrites are not wrapped in connective tissue. You have free nerve endings. 
for pain and temperature are examples of unencapsulated free nerve endings and found in the skin and the mucous membranes. Tactile discs are for light touch and texture. Like the example here where I was feeling my way around, light touch. Merkel discs at the base of the epidermis. Hair receptors. They wrap around the base hair follicle and they monitor that movement of hair. So if, if you think about it, like the hair on your arms and on your legs gives you feedback about your surrounding environment. Tells you if you forgot to put your pants on or if you're wearing a long sleeve or a short sleeve shirt. It tells you if you brushed up against something, right? A lot of animals have modified hair like whiskers to determine, you know, where they are. Like cats have whiskers that are the length of their body so they know if my whiskers fit, I can squeeze through. So highlighting this top row of unencapsulated, free nerve endings, tactile discs, as well as hair receptors. All part of the general census. Encapsulated, the bottom two rows. So this bigger fi figure, we're down here now on encapsulated. These are a little bit more sophisticated. They're organized in a little, with a little bit more biological energy to make them happen. So you see the, the tactile corpuscle, the miser's corpuscle, the end bulb, the bulbous corpuscle, lamellar corpuscle, and then two of the favorites from the last couple of units, the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon. These are all encapsulated, meaning they have a connective tissue capsule, dendrites that are wrapped by this connective tissue, or in some cases they may be glial cells and nervous tissue. And this connective tissue helps to enhance the sensitivity of the response. So encapsulated nerve endings like Meisner's corpuscle, light touch and texture. We talked about that one extensively today. At the level of the derma papilla of hairless skin. Then we have our cross and end bulbs. Tactile, found in the mucous membranes. Let you know that there's something there in our mucous membranes. Gives you feedback about light pressure. Right? All of us, this is going to be a funny example, but all of you have had something in your nose, you're like, I got to go blow my nose because it's awkward to put your finger up there, right? But you can feel there's something there. You're kind of doing one of these. You're like, you know, because you're getting feedback from the Krauss end bulbs in the mucus lining of your nostrils telling you there's a booger in there, Right? So it's that sensitive, when you think about it, that's an airway. Why would that be brought to your attention by sensory information? Because that's an airway that you're, you need to keep open. Pacinian corpuscles or lamellar corpuscles, these are found deeper in the dermis. The Pacinian corpuscles are for deep pressure, deep touch. They're found also in the periosteum of the bone. Um, give information about uh, stretch or vibration or if you're being tickled, right? It's, a, it's a, a, a bigger pressure than what you would find with the Meisner or the tactile corpuscle. And then the Ruffini or the bulbous corpuscles. Tonic, again, heavy, heavy pressure or uh, force, joint movements and skin stretching. Okay. Encapsulated versus unencapsulated. Questions? Okay, the last little segment today, um, we're going to talk about pain. And we'll finish up a little early today. Um, and then Wednesday we'll come back and we'll start talking about the homework assignments with filling out the compare and contrast between general and special, <clears throat> and then the examples of transducers.
Yeah. Well, the pressure that's found in the skin and the bone um, would, wouldn't give you information about like joint position, for example, but like joint position here will tell you, you know, if you're, you know, you're flexing your leg or whether you've extended your leg. So that would be the big difference. Okay. All right, so pain is an interesting um, piece of sensory information. And I don't have to, you know, belabor the point because even in a young audience like this, you've all experienced pain. I'm not talking emotional. I'm talking like physical pain. I'm sure there's been emotional pain too, right? Enough life has passed and you've seen both. But everyone's having injury. Everyone's cut themselves, probably broken a bone, okay? There's pain in our life that gives us information that's important for our survival, so let me explain. <clears throat> if, you ex if you're experiencing a lot of pain in your leg and you decide that you're going to medicate and take ibuprofen or Tylenol to get through the sporting event that you love so much and it doesn't hurt anymore, what's the danger? What's the danger in that situation for the future health care providers in this room? You could cause more injury, maybe even permanent damage. Absolutely. Because that pain feedback is telling you it hurts when I do this, right? And the goofy answer is, well, then don't do that anymore. <laughs> like, hey, doc, it hurts when I go like this. Well, here, don't, don't go like that, and then it won't hurt, right? So if you take medication to get rid of that, you mask the symptom of pain and you move on, you may be doing more underlying damage. Now, I get it. Athletes, right, in my family, everywhere we go, I bring a bottle of IB, IB broken is what we call it, right? Dad, I need three IB brokens. I'm like, got it. I'll be right back, right? It's in the glove box. So, yeah, it's a little hypocritical, but the point is, you're just masking a response that's telling you feedback about something that's not right. And if you don't go have that looked at, you're not doing yourself any favors because pain is the way that your body gives you clues about something is not right. Make sense? So discomfort caused by tissue injury, some noxious stimulation leading to some evasive action. You know, what, what I mean by that is you walk and you're like, oh, Oh, it hurts. So, so now you start walking without bending it to avoid that kind of pain response, right? So that's the evasive action. But it's important because it actually protects us. It hurts to bend your legs, so you don't bend your legs, so now you have a limp when you walk. In a case of diabetes mellitus that's unmanaged, that many of the future healthcare providers in this room will be experiencing. This is an extreme example, but I want to talk about it. In patients that wrestle with diabetes mellitus, that's type 2 diabetes, classically referred to as adult onset, but it's not always in adults. Now we're seeing it in younger, younger patients. But what happens is you have too much sugar, too much glucose inside the bloodstream. And the sugar, the blood isn't supposed to be carrying that much sugar. It's supposed to be in the cell. The cell is the one that uses the sugar for energy. But if you can't bring the glucose into the cell, it actually circulates in the bloodstream as high blood glucose. Well, it causes a lot of damage to the inside of the blood vessel. Now the blood is not as watery. It's more viscous, like sugar water. So now as it pulsates through the bloodstream, it causes damage to the endothelium. It also reduces the ability for oxygen to be transferred because of the high glucose concentration. So now the, the red blood cell won't unload the oxygen as well to the muscle or to the, to the distal tissues. Okay? You have circulation problems in these patients, typically in the lower extremities. 
can be all over, but usually in the lower extremities. Now blood flow to the feet is compromised because of high sugar levels. We're talking a long period of time in these patients. Unmanaged, meaning they're not watching their sugar levels. So you lose blood flow to the distal extremities. One of the first things that happens, the first sign of complicated, unmanaged diabetes mellitus is neuropathy. That's that pinprick feeling when your foot falls asleep. That's the early sign that the nerve gives your body that the nerve is dying, is that pinprick feeling. It's starved of oxygen. So in you and I, we just kind of move our foot, right? You do your little trick, you stomp it. Like, what's wrong? Oh, my foot's asleep. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Right? That, that's what diabetic patients that are unmanaged that have diabetic neuropathy, they experience that all the time. They can no longer really feel their toes or their feet. So if they kick the bedpost, step on a sharp object or a carpet tack, they don't feel it. And now it bleeds. It's a wound. It's under perfuse, so it won't heal very well. It turns into an ulcer. That's a diabetic foot ulcer. That spreads, becomes infected. And unfortunately, oftentimes it leads to amputations of the foot and the lower limb and maybe the entire leg. So just an extreme example of how pain feedback helps us and is allowing us to survive. And when that pain response in our diabetic patients is gone and they have diabetic neuropathy, they can't feel the pain anymore in their lower feet. And a lot of us might think, well, that should feel great. There's no pain. No, it feels numb, pinprick feeling. They injure themselves. They don't know it. And it doesn't heal well. So pain, as we talked about earlier, nociception. We can either have nociception happen in two different modalities, either fast pain, which should make sense to you intuitively now based upon what you know. Fast pain travels via myelinated fibers at a speed of 12 to 30 meters per second. That's the velocity of fast pain. That's sharp, localized stabbing pain that's perceived with an injury. Whereas dull pain or slow pain travels via unmyelinated fibers at 0.5 to 2 meters per second. It's longer lasting, it's diffuse, it's got that dull, difficult to pinpoint aspect to it. Somatic pain. Somatic pain usually is coming from skin, muscles and joints, visceral pain from the viscera, usually you know, ischemia of tissues um, that are poorly localized or some sort of stretch or chemical irritation from the viscera, something you ate, something that's not agreeing with you. Injured tissues in any of these areas release chemicals that stimulate the pain fibers, these nociceptors. The one that's the most well-known is bradykinin. That's the most patent, uh, potent pain stimulator that we know of. It makes us aware of these injuries. Um, there are others like histamine, prostaglandin, and serotonin that also will stimulate the pain receptor or the nociceptor. Referred pain is usually from the viscera, right? We mistakenly think of it as coming from like some superficial location, usually like from the skin. Um, you know, an example is like a heart attack. We talked about this in the nerve physiology section when we were talking about peripheral nervous system. Patient that had experiences a heart attack, which is part of the thoracic viscera, a lot of the plexi, the thoracic nerves that come off or the cervical plexus that comes off the area of the heart, which is slightly to the left of midline, is shared by the left arm. And so now you have pain response in patients that are having a heart attack where they get left arm pain. Right? An example of, of, of referred pain. So now that's the result of a converging neural pathway that we just talked about. So this, the brain's assuming this visceral pain is coming from some other location like the left arm or some superficial site. So heart pain, 
spinal cord segments T1 to T5. Now, if we look at referred pain throughout a map of the body, you can, you can kind of appreciate where, you know, some of these, like for example, the liver and the gallbladder that's located here on the right side is going to refer up more superficially to the right upper neck and shoulder. Oddly, it's not down here, right? So this is referred pain. So in a lot of your future studies, you may look at maps of pain receptors to try to understand in medicine on physical exam without imaging, you can actually appreciate, okay, where is this pain response coming from? And can I locate what's happening in certain patients? So visceral pain is misinterpreted as coming from some superficial location, you know, like not the gallbladder or the liver. It feels like the skin or the neck or the shoulder on the right side. Okay, example about pain receptors. Uh, you know, the other thing we use a lot in my house is, is um, um, it's not icy hot anymore. What's the roller kind? Uh, what is it? No, it's not Tiger Bomb. It's green. What's it now? What's that? Biofreeze. That's what it is. Everyone is, all the girls like, my girls all like Biofreeze. So they're all pretty much the same, right? Back in the 80s, I think it was called Ben Gay is what we used in the 80s, right? But they all have an active ingredient known as methyl salicylate. That's that strong smell odor that you get from Icy Hot or Biofreeze. Okay, so these damaged tissues are releasing bradykinin, um, histamine, prostaglandins, and they stimulate the nociceptor, right? Those are the neurotransmitter that send the signal to the nociceptor. The first fast pain receptors are like sharp stabbing pain, myelinated axons. The second Slow response is dull, diffuse, unmyelinated, travels slower. Now, Icy Hot, Biofreeze, Tiger Balm, methyl salicylate gets on the skin and triggers a cool, hot zone temperature differential. And that signal that's being interpreted shares similar pathways of pain through nociception back to the brain. But the temperature signal travels more quickly to the brain and the pain signal is a little slower. So the brain perceives the temperature differential and interprets the signal as being hot, cool, hot, cool, and doesn't actually receive the pain signal as aggressively. And that's why these methyl salicylates that have been around for thousands of years this is, like, this is actually Eastern medicine, right? There were plants and herbs in Persia and in Asia that were being utilized as topicals to, as an analgesic. Now, is it a drug? Sort of. You're not consuming it, and you're just kind of tricking the body into thinking that the pain is no longer there. It's just the signal for the hot cool that shares the same pathway as nociception makes it to the brain more quickly. Kind of cool, right? So does it work? Yeah, it works. Is it fixing anything? No, right? Is it safe? It's very safe as long as you don't rub your eye after you put it on, okay? All right, so <clears throat> talk about this pathway. Last slide for today, and then we'll wrap up about 15 minutes early. So we have a, a, a root here. So here's a finger sticking over a flame. I don't know why you would do this other than to demonstrate something in this class. And you have a nociceptor, a pain receptor, that's going to send a signal to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, right? The posterior aspect of the spinal cord. So we've simplified the diagram. It always used to look like, on the last exam, right, it was a, it was a spinal cord slice. Now it's just an oval. But you know what that means. It's coming in the sensory, so it's coming in the back. And so the nociception comes in, and it's releasing 
the first neurotransmitter known as substance P. And that innervates or sends the signal, pathway 2, up this spinal thalamic track from the spine to the thalamus, the thalamus being the relay center, up to the cerebral cortex, to the midbrain, down to the medulla oblongata, the reticulospinal tract, sending signals here of serotonin, and sending signals here uh, as well to turn off or negatively inhibit the pain response. And number six that innervates onto number seven, these are enkephalins. These are the natural um, endorphins or a natural morphine analgesic that the body actually utilizes. These endogenous opioids, enkephalins or endorphins. So they're very similar in molecular architecture to morphine. And in extreme circumstances, you actually can turn off the pain by your own analgesic, right? You see this in elite athletes that fight through the pain. You see these in um, very stressful situations where, you know, there's been examples of moms that have, um, you know, had like their infant trapped under a car and, you know, this 110 pound mother lifts up the back of the car and pulls the infant out. People are like, how did that just happen? Right? So these endogenous opioids. So this, this route that I'm showing you is putting together a lot of information that we've covered in the past. The new information is this nociceptor sending the first order neuron neurotransmitter known as substance P, right? It's easy to remember, substance P for pain. This first order neuron goes onto our second order neuron, up to the brain, process it, coming back down, deciding if you're shutting it off, if you're actually analgesic release through enkephalin or endorphin. So this is how we monitor our pain. And it's also how you, know, you can become accustomed to living with a certain amount of pain, and you'll see that in your patients, right? Every patient has different levels of pain thresholds because everybody's physiology is a little bit different here. Some, pa some patients are more susceptible to pain. They can't handle any pain. Other patients have been dealing with pain for years, and they just say, I just live with it. I actually don't even really notice it. Some days are really bad. Other days aren't so bad. Some days they may be releasing more of the encephalins and the endorphins than others. Okay? So it's interesting how pain is important to our homeostatic life and our sense of survival. Questions? That's all I have for you today. Don't forget, Friday is quiz, the last quiz. And you have homework assignment for Wednesday. I'll see you on Wednesday, and we'll pick it up there.